Okay, well, I guess I'm going to go ahead and get started. So uh, thanks, everyone, for joining this demo of uh, Zenity. Uh, my name is Connor Mooney. I'm an account executive here at Zenity, uh, cover uh, the New England territory. It's nice, nice to meet everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do for this demonstration is just sort of walk through a little bit about Zenity, what we're seeing in the um, enterprise co-pilot and low-code development space, um, and then go into a demo of the product and highlight some violations that we've identified and ways to go about remediating them. Um, at any point, uh, feel, feel free to uh, pop any questions into the chat and we will go ahead and do our best to answer those. So, so oops, let's look here. Uh, so very quickly, um, you know, I'm sure as this is not new to many folks on the call, um, but we're starting to see really exponential growth of the low code applications and co-pilots. Um, this is actually real world customer data of their growth quarter over quarter. Um, and in a lot of cases, specifically around, you know, uh, platforms like Microsoft and Salesforce, um, you know, these tools are really being pushed on their customers. Um, but they bring, uh, very similar security risk to traditional application development. Um, so folks who are involved in AppSec, um, a lot of these items won't be necessarily new to you. Hard-coded secrets, excessive permissions, uh, DLP bypass. However, because of the way these applications are created, um, whether through a low-code platform or Gen AI, uh, they require a new approach. Um, and some reasons why that is, is because there's no SDLC, so there's minimal uh, pipeline control. Um, these apps are not being built with traditional application code, um, so there's really no ability to do like static code or dynamic code analysis. Um, in many cases, and we can share some documentation on this, there's really no oversight from IT. A lot of CTOs, a lot of CISOs don't really know this is going on. Um, because these are being built by business users, not necessarily uh, traditional developers or um, architects. Um, and the growth is exponential. Um, so again, this is coming and it's growing rapidly. Um, so why do legacy approaches, why are they not really suitable for, for these kinds of challenges? So one, there are some native tools like Microsoft COE, um, but those tools, one, work in conjunction with Zenity, so most of our customers use both. And COE is really geared towards uh, inventory. It's an open source tool, so it does require a, a bit, if not more, maintenance. Um, and we found from our customer base, it doesn't scale uh, very well once you uh, deploy a large citizen development program. Uh, like I touched on, traditional application scanners are not applicable here because there's really no code to scan. Um, and then even what we're seeing in the space now is a lot of SaaS security tools, but the SaaS security tools are really focused on platform and the APIs. Um, you know, what Zenity is focused on is not securing your Salesforce instance, but securing the applications, the flows, the bots, the agents being created within that platform. What makes up these components? Who created them? How are they being used? Where is the risk? Um, and then also, you know, a lot of data loss prevention tools um, aren't applicable here too because they're very binary and they're more geared towards governance, less for security. Um, so this, what does Zenity provide that legacy solutions don't? Um, so first is, you know, real-time cross-platform visibility into your apps, your bots, your agents, your co-pilots, what makes up those applications and co-pilots, who's using them, how they're using them, how the business is engaging with them. Um, then we map that to our risk assessment. Um, so our co-founder, Michael, is leading the OWASP top 10 for low code, and we're also mapping to the MITRE attack framework. So allowing organizations to map to some type of security control for auditing purposes uh, like SOC 2 and PCI. Um, next piece is, um, as I'm sure folks on the call can imagine, um, since these tools are being developed in a lot of cases by the business owners and sometimes are outside the purview of IT, um, we're able to provide automated remedi remediation and governance. Um, so burning down these issues and preventing new ones from making their way 
into these applications. Again, these are not traditional users. They're not developers, they're business users. So we need a way to engage with them. And then as you saw on some of the slides, earlier slides, there's exponential growth. Um, so this has to be automated. Um, and then lastly, we've built out an AI trust layer. Um, so we're looking at AI security posture management and AI detection and response. And what I'll do is I'll highlight an example of that in the platform on how we've identified a co-pilot that could be exploited. Um, so tying into that governance piece, because just talking to my customers and, and folks in the industry, this is very important to them, is the ability to burn down that risk in a programmatic, automated fashion, a way you can engage with these users. Um, and this is a real world example. This is an actual customer and they're a large financial services company. So I'd imagine everyone on this call has heard of them. Um, and what you can see is it's, it's a twofold. It's the rapid growth of these applications and automations over time, and then our ability to reduce the risk by 80% in three months of deployment. And again, that is our governance policies. And I'll show some examples of how we can engage with those users. And in some cases, what we do is uh, silent remediation, where we make the change um, without impacting the users or the applications, um, but remediating that violation or um, insecure connection as an example. Um, so this is sort of our, our dashboard at a high level, but what I'd like to do now is really just hop into the platform, highlight some of the uh, dashboards in Zenity and some real world examples of how we can secure low code, no code applications. So real quickly at a very high level, what you can see here is um, our, our dashboard, like all good SaaS security tools, you, you must have a dashboard. And I should note that at present, Zenity is a, is a fully SaaS tool. Um, however, we are working with some customers on other deployments and happy to have conversations about that. Um, at a very high level, just want to touch on before we go into the examples is, you know, it, again, unlike a lot of tools out there in the space for co-pilots and low code applications, we're cross platform. So not only do we support, you know, Microsoft Power Platform, Salesforce, ServiceNow, uh, Ricardo. Um, Power BI. So again, a one-stop shop to secure all your low-code, no-code Gen AI platforms. Um, next, we map these to our risk rating. Um, and again, not to belabor the point, but because these applications are by business users, we map security risk, but we also map a business criticality risk. Um, and what we're doing for business criticality, it's a little bit of our secret sauce, but it's made up of over 20 different categories. So an example would be, you know, how many users have access to this application? How credible is the user who created it? Um, how often is it being accessed or updated? Um, so like a quick example, you may have a high severity violation for an application that was created and then never really used again. Or you have a medium severity violation for a flow that is being used by the entire organization and is being updated on a daily basis. So we would raise that criticality. Um, another aspect to the dashboard is you, you can identify your low code, no code adoption. Um, again, because these tools are new, uh, businesses are using these to be more efficient. And again, Microsoft and a lot of other vendors are really pushing these on their customers. Um, this allows organizations to get a sense of what that adoption looks like and, again, help forecast where the business is going, but also where your risk might be. Um, and I, what I want to do now is just sort of hop into a quick example of some high severity issues that we've identified. So what we're seeing here is I, I went into uh, our sort of high criticality examples here on our violations page. And there's a lot of ways to sort this. Um, you can do it by platform, by type by policy violation, attack framework. So again, a lot of ways to look at this. First and last scene, you can uh, customize the columns and even export into a CSV. Um, but the first example I wanna show, so this is, a, this is a Power Platform example. So Microsoft Power Platform. Um, and I'm gonna click into this real quick. And what we're seeing here is a, an example of data flowing from one environment to another, okay? So while we do have the graph built out here, um, we also provide it just in simple, plain English. Um, so right here, you can see that you have data flowing from Jamie spot, and it is flowing out of that environment to Zenity demo. Um, now, 
this is this is important because what's happening here is you're passing data from one environment to another. And what this does is it defeats, you know, many organizations policies or controls that they have set for these specific environments to prevent bad things from happening. And and this is actually a, a real world example where we had a customer um, who set up multiple zones for their power apps uh, deployment. They have a large citizen development program and they would actually ask their users. They fill out a questionnaire. You know, what, what are you trying to build? What are you trying to do? And then they would be sent to a zone. It was like red, yellow or green based off of what those users told them. And what we were able to do was help this organization understand what the users were telling them because it was a static sort of survey versus what was actually being built in the environment. And not all of it was malicious. In many cases, it was just users that sort of changed what they were doing versus when they initially filled out the form or were just unaware of certain violations that they may have been exposing the organization to. Um, so that's a very high level example of just sort of data sovereignty and a, a flow within Microsoft Power Power Apps. Do you want to pause if there's any questions? Does it look like it? Um, next, just want to highlight another example, um, and this is Power uh, Power BI. Um, so, as most folks may be familiar, you know, Power BI pulls in from a lot of different data sources, so you can create reports and dashboards and things of that nature. And so, what we're seeing here is um, a data source that is being connected from a disallowed endpoint. And I do want to know, we work with our customers on this, on you know, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Now, in many cases, you may think, well, you know, it's accessing data. It shouldn't be, but maybe it's not being used. And because Zenity really breaks down all the components of these flows and apps, we can tell you, okay, it is accessing data. It shouldn't. And this data is in use. There's a, a dashboard um, and a report being created. So it sort of poses two issues to the organization. One is just a data hygiene issue. Should we be using this data? Is this a production dashboard or a production report? Um, sort of, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And then two, from a security perspective, you know, is there malware in this data set? Or even kind of taking it a step further, could there be malicious instructions to a co-pilot that has access to this data source, to this power Power BI flow. Um, and happy to share this, but our CTO, Michael, gives a great great uh, presentation at Black Hat about promptware injections into co-pilots where you could make a co-pilot do something malicious. Maybe it decides to you know, copy the entire dashboard and send it to someone who shouldn't have it. So that's just a quick example of a, a Power BI flow and sort of what connections are allowed and what are not allowed. And then the last example I do want to show just at a very high level, I'm just sort of trying to hit on all, all the, as much of the platforms as we support in the high notes is a, a co-pilot accepting unauthenticated chat. So the, the co-pilot here, this is actually a created by co-pilot studio. Um, and, and these co-pilots are created to do specific tasks um, by business users. And they can use natural language, you know, create me a co-pilot that converts my, Excel database into a, a SQL or, or something like that. Um, but the issue with these, these co-pilots is they, they tend to come with, you know, for lack of a better example, a lot of baggage. Um, you know, these co-pilots are made up of, you know, topics and transcripts and, and actions. And what we're, we're able to do is we have a strong understanding of, you know, what has made, what makes up this co-pilot, what components make it up. And we have uh, a lot of, policies out of the box that we can identify violations related to that co-pilot. Um, and in this specific example, what we have is we have a co-pilot uh, that is publicly accessible to, to the global internet. So really anyone can go talk to this co-pilot and ask it questions in, in a native language. Um, so that's kind of the first piece you'd want to be worried about. Now, in some cases, you, you may want that. In a lot of cases, you may not. Um, the other piece here is this co-pilot has an action and it has access to this SharePoint. So beyond just that the co-pilot is unauthenticated so anyone can talk to it, because of that action now, really anything Chris has access to in SharePoint, the co-pilot has access to and therefore the global, really anyone can access that. Now, again, in many cases, you may want that. In some cases, you may not. Um, but again, organizations need to understand what is making up these co-pilots 
and how they're being used. And that's what Zenity really does with co-pilots. We can tell you, you know, what type of data sets these co-pilots are accessing, what kind of external connections they may have, and then whether they're locked down properly or not. Um, so that is a quick example there. Uh, do you want to pause, see if there's any questions from the, from the team? Nope. All right. So moving on, next, what I really do want to highlight is um, a few more pieces. So one is the playbooks. So I just showed a lot of problems and I'm sure, you know, many folks are like, oh, great, a bunch of things I have to go about fixing. Um, but we try to make that as simple as possible. So out of the box, we, we have some out of the box playbooks and there's a lot of ways to engage with the users and you can create custom playbooks. Um, so this is kind of that governance piece on that slide I showed with the large financial. This is what allowed us to burn down 80% of the risk in um, three months while their low code, no code app was growing, um, usage was growing. And what you see here is a lot of ways to customize this, but this is just a quick example. And I wanted to highlight this because it's it's a it's a um, playbook that engages with the user, but then also does what we refer to as silent remediation. So here we can see, you know, hey, um, we want to enforce uh, SQL connections for these service accounts. Um, and what we've, we've identified that, and first, you know, we sent an email to that user to let them know. Um, we, we have detailed instructions in our knowledge base, but you can also build in your own knowledge base and your own remediation method and description of the problem for those users. Uh, and then what we had here is, okay, you know, hey, if the user doesn't engage with us, doesn't respond to the email, we don't see this has been changed, then go ahead and delete the connection and then send them an email and let them know. And again, because we understand how all these applications are being used, what components they're working with, we know that removing that connection won't really impact this application. So it's a, a silent remediation. But again, just wanted to give this as an example, a lot of ways to engage with these users, whether it's through email, text, uh, maybe you, you, you set up another email to engage with the administrator as opposed to the user to let them know someone on their team needs to make a change. And then lastly, if you wanna go about and just make that correction through Zenity, you, you have the ability to do that. Um, and then really the last piece I did wanna touch on at a very high level is our policies. Um, so much like um, sort of existing application development, although again, this is a lot different, um, you may have different types of accounts. So staging, production, you know, maybe finance versus accounting, things like that. Um, so I did wanna highlight that you do have the ability to create custom policies and build out policies specific to an environment, just like you would do if you were building a cloud native application and you probably got like a, prod and stage and dev and, and AWS. So again, allowing organizations to help build out some semblance of a software development life cycle so they can understand certain violations. And again, and again, I'm actually happy to share this. The report was put together by uh, Shell Oil Company about how they have different zones based off of what their users are doing. So again, we have the ability to um, really slice and dice our policies to make sure these users can still build applications and are not getting alerted to things that may not be relevant, while security can put those controls in place based off of the environment. Um, that really is uh, the overview at a very, very high level. Um, I do want to thank uh, all the folks for joining. Uh, want to see any questions, comments, concern. I'm happy to address them. If anybody would like a uh, link to uh, Michael's Black Hat presentation on um, uh, uh, hijacking a co-pilot. I'm happy to share that and even happy to share um, the landing zones that uh, Shell put together for um, uh, their citizen development program. Okay, uh, no questions. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Really appreciate your time. Again, my name is Connor Mooney. Uh, you can reach me at Connor1NM at Zenity.io. Uh, Happy to do another demonstration or do a deeper dive um, for any anybody who's interested.